Welcome to a presentation on swath or windrow grazing and alternative livestock feeding techniques. This presentation was developed and presented by Steve Foster, University of Nevada Cooperative Extension in Pershing County. Basically what we want to learn through this presentation today is what is swath or windrow grazing, some advantages and disadvantages of it. The basic guidelines are best management practices if you'd like to try this um, operation and uh, how it affects forage quality, your cattle performance, and then I'll finish up with some research done at the University of Nevada Reno Gun Ranch on basin wild dry and also prescribed burns. I think most all ranchers are interested in lowering their production costs and uh, we all know that one of the largest expenses on your ranch is that of winter feeds. With present drought conditions that may extend not only to winter time but also through the summer and late, early and late fall. So this could be a potential, um, I guess, practice that could reduce uh, not only your winter feed costs but in drought situation your overall feeding cost. What is swath grazing? Well, it's a process of cutting hay, leaving it in windrows, and allowing the livestock to graze these windrows during the winter months. It offers potential to lower production costs, but it's maybe not for everybody. You've got to have the right topography. Of course, you're going to have to have a water source for these, uh, these livestock when they're out in the field grazing. Uh, some type of fencing is preferred, and then some other factors that we'll discuss later on. Basically, most of the research I found for this presentation was out of Canada, where they have a shorter growing season, uh, and therefore it's being done most extensively with annual crops such as oats and barley in these short growing season areas. However, some ranchers are swath grazing the perennial hay crops, leaving them in windrows for winter grazing by their livestock. Practice has been used during open winters and snow depths of over two feet with no apparent problem. Therefore, if you live in an area that you may have that, you can see in this lower picture, if you're up to two feet, those cattle can usually get down and nose themselves into the, uh, the windrows. Basic advantages, we're looking at reduced labor requirements. As you can see, the comparison of pictures, it's much easier and requires less labor just to mow and windrow this hay, then turn your livestock in here for grazing, compared to the older picture on the right, where this had to be mowed, uh, raked, baled, loaded onto the wagon, taken to the barn, or some storage area, unloaded, and then reloaded and taken back out to the field to feed the livestock in the winter time. One ranch in Utah cut its labor force in half by switching this type of haying and feeding technique. Another advantage, of course, we talked about the reduced cost for hay and feeding. If you look at some of the estimated ranges of uh, cost of production for baling hay, down here we know swathing is uh, estimated between $8 and $12 per acre cost. Raking will run you three to four dollars per acre. And of course baling is eight to ten acres, hauling and stacking another eight to ten acres cost, and then taking it back out and feeding in at five to ten acres with a total range between thirty two and forty two dollars per acre of baling, hauling, storing, and taking back out and feeding. If we compare this to swath grazing, eliminates that baling and hauling, stacking and feeding, and can reduce your cost to a minimum, at least a minimum of sixteen dollars per acre. However, we do have to figure back in some cost for electric fence and labor to move those livestock. So we're probably going to add back uh, about, take away $2 per acre in cost there. So at least uh, you're still looking at a minimum of $14 per acre. One hidden cost we don't always look at, but maybe it would be machinery longevity. The less we use that baler and tractor and hauling and feeding equipment, the longer they should last uh, and therefore saving us some more money. Another advantage, of course, is manure handling. When we bring these animals in in a concentrated area, we have concentrated um, amounts of manure in which we have to go ahead and haul, take out in the field, and land apply later on, which is going to cost us some money. If we got them already out in the field and we have an even distribution of their feed and grazing patterns, we should have an even distribution of manure across the field, therefore saving us manure hauling cost. A disadvantage of um, windrow grazing would probably be crusting the snow and, and when there's ice formed on top. If that happens, we're probably going to have to go out with some type of equipment, a tractor or something, break that up and give access to the forage. There may be times where the extreme weather may cause problems, with it for especially if we get snow deeper than two to three feet, where we're probably going to have to supplemental feed, but hopefully that will be only for a short time. Another disadvantage, of course, wildlife will be attracted. A survey of Canadian producers indicated that 23% of them had wildlife problems. 
however, I guess if you want the wildlife in Canada, the survey reported that deer and elk prefer to oat swath over barley swaths. So if you want to attract them, plant oats instead of, um, instead of barley. I think one of the biggest probably disadvantages to this practice would be the wind. Um, we know, you know, the winds that can pick up, especially in our areas of Nevada here, uh, and can blow windrows around. However, experience shows the wind is not a problem if the windrows are managed properly. Mainly we're looking at rolling them up right behind the swather. And I'm afraid if we have winds like this picture depicts down here, these are actually round bales that started in the northern, or the upper part of this picture here when blown curve across the field to the lower part. I think winds of that uh, magnitude would be a problem with, with any type of a hay system. Okay, basic guidelines or best management practices for swath or windrow grazing. <clears throat> Our main objective is to cut the forage crop, whether it's an annual or perennial, in the fall, uh, usually around late August, September, depending on the individual climatic conditions and the maturity of that plant to get the highest quality forage that can be stockpiled or windrowed in the field and fed to our livestock. Uh, this may cause you, if you're going to plant annual forage, barley or oats, you may have to delay your planting late into the spring, early summer, so they'll be in the early dose stage in September for windrowing. This is the stage we get the optimum forage quality. If you're uh, going to go and do this practice with perennial forages, you should be grazed or you've got to harvest it, you've got to time that in the early spring so the regrowth is at the higher quality vegetative stage in the fall, uh, usually that late August or September when you want to go ahead and windrow it. Raking, and we mentioned a little bit earlier about that, but uh, together should be done with the uh, hay is still moist and before it's allowed to dry out. We want the best idea is to rake right behind the swath or mower, and uh, that'll help build a tighter, compact windrow, windrow that is less susceptible to wind damage. Cross fencing, when we go ahead and, and want to go ahead and feed these windrows, the best uh, way to do that is to utilize cross fencing with electric fence. Uh, to control the time and amount of forage animals have available. Electric fence should be placed at right angles to the windrow. When the fence is moved, the butt end of the open windrow should be left in the newly fenced area. This leaves some hay exposed in the cattle starting point where they will continue to graze up the windrow. This will help, um, as I'll mention here later on, uh, reduce any wastage, get even distribution of the livestock grazing, and uh, should be more efficient option. Here's an example of what I'm trying to explain here. We have a water source, we have cattle, uh, and these are uh, evenly distributed across the windrows and we have a temporary electric fence. We're going to go ahead when they have uh, depleted that supply of forage, we're going to move the fence forward and they'll continue to follow that into the new grazing area and therefore we'll be more efficient in our operation. Uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be more efficient if we compare this to just going out and feeding bale hay out in the field. Uh, Waste range from 5 to 30 percent for windrow grazing. If we compare that to the waste of baling and feeding, we're looking at 15 to 40 percent. So if done right, it can reduce the amount of wastage that you'll have in your feeding. Uh, one thing, if you don't want to put up fencing, uh, you can probably get by with sending through the first time a group of livestock that have a higher nutritional requirement. And then as they go through, you can take them out and follow them up with a group of livestock, or in this case, we have cattle or some bulls in the non-breeding season with a lower nutrient uh, requirement and use them to clean up the excessive waste in that field. If we try to compare forage quality between the two, this was a study done in Nebraska in 2002, compared the crude protein of windrowed, baled, and standing meadow forages. As you can see in the graph, the pro crude protein content of the windrowed and baled stayed constant through the September to February months at about 10 point 10.5%. If we looked at the standing crude protein, it declined and continued to decline through the winter months, going from 10.5, clear down to about 5.5% crude protein. Quite a big difference there in forage quality. If we look at cattle performance, this was a study also done um, in Nebraska, 2002, body weights and gains of cattle graze windrowed or fed baled hay, meadow hay. And if we look at that, we can see the average daily gains of calves grazed forages and windrows along with meadow regrowth was equal to or better than calves fed uh, baled hay in a dry lot. You can actually see the big difference in 97 through 98 study where the average daily gain uh, pounds per day in windrow grazing was 1.17 compared to the bale fed of 0.86. 
Uh, again, in 98 and 99, they were more comparable, but again, the uh, window grazing was slightly higher at 0.57 pounds per day compared to 0.53 in the bale fit. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and look at a study done, as I mentioned earlier, at the University of Nevada Reno Gun Ranch. This study compared the nutritional properties of windrowed and standing basin wild rye over time and also assessed the effects of managed fire on basin wild rye standing crop production. You see the title of this uh, study was Nutritional Properties of Windrowed and Standing Basin Wild Rye Over Time. Important characteristics we need to consider here in basin wild rye is the elevated meristematic or growing point of this plant, which is usually about 10 to 12 inches above the crown. What this uh, feature causes a problem with, if we would go out and graze it in the spring or early summer, or even mowed it early, uh, it's not recommended because we'd be removing that growing point um, at an early stage, causing the decline in plant vigor and survival. However, when we, let, we wait till late summer, fall, or early winter forage, uh, the growing point concern is not a problem, and I'll illustrate this in the next slide. As you can see here, the vegetative stage on the left, this is a plant with a low growing point. If we cut it above that growing point, that plant can go ahead and regenerate vegetative growth above it, usually from the uh, stored food source or the carbohydrates in the root system. And then once the green uh, vegetation is produced, it can go ahead and restore those back to the root system through photosynthesis. In the elongated stage, we can see here, if we go ahead and cut this plant here, uh, we'll go ahead and remove the growing point. That plant cannot regenerate any more uh, green vegetation and photosynthesis has pretty much stopped and uh, regeneration of any carbohydrates or food source of the root system will stop and that plant will eventually die out. If we allow that plant to get to reproductive stage, it's going to next in maturity. This is a higher quality of uh, that plant. Uh, cutting this either low or high at this point, that plant has already rejuvenated its root system and therefore will not uh, be a problem in the vigor of that plant for the next year. If we wait till the dormant stage, we lose some quality, but again, we've replenished that root system even more and uh, we'll have a more vigorous plant the following growing season. In this uh, graph here, we're comparing the principal nutrient contents of the average by month for standing in windrow basin while dry. Uh, we, I averaged these uh, months from July, February, including years 2005 and 2009. As we go down through you here, you can see there was a difference in standing uh, NDF uh, compared to the windrowed NDF at 73.3 compared to 69.83. Uh, again, the standing ADF was higher in uh, standing at 50.54 compared to the windrow ADF at 42.24. I think the biggest difference if we look at that, uh, one is dry matter. We've got more dry matter because that plant is not deteriorating in the windrow system over the winter months compared to the standing. At, compared to the windrow, we had 89.47% uh, dry matter compared to 73.98. But the biggest one here is the um, windrow crew protein. Uh, the windrow crew pr protein is at 13.51 compared to the average over the months of the standing crew protein uh, falling at an average of 5.53. That's a big difference in forage quality if you're looking to uh, maintain your livestock over those winter months. During the macro mineral content, again, we averaged the months for the standing windrow base wild dry from July through February for 2005 and 2009. Not a lot of difference between uh, these minerals except if we look at potassium. Uh, 2.83 in the windrow potassium compared to the standing potassium 1.31. Uh, however, if you look at standing, uh, calcium did maintain a little better calcium at 0 0.23 compared to the windrow calcium at 0 0.17. Here was where the study was uh, performed. This is basically uh, rabbit brush, uh, some sagebrush, but the majority of the undergrowth in here is Great Basin Wild Rye. That was a prescribed burn. Uh, was conducted to try to eliminate the uh, rabbit brush, some of the sagebrush, and allow the Great Basin Wild Rye to flourish then. Here you can see the comparison with the burned area on the left primarily the base and wild rye coming back and the non-burn or controlled area on the right. This is the base and wild rye area. After the burn, you can see the establishment and the revegetation of the great base and wild rye. 
If you look at the numbers, again, I said that the area was dominant, dominated by salt rabbit brush. The prescribed burn was in the fall of 2003, and also, and then uh, you can see the results. Then in 2005 and 2009, the standing crop production was five to six times higher in burned areas for both those years. 2005, 7.6 tons per acre compared to 1.5 in the non-burner controlled area. 2009, 6.7 tons per acre compared to 1.15 tons per acre in the non-burned area. Overall results, the windrow basin uh, wild drive provided greater nutritional quality over time than the standing basin wild drive forages. There were more dry matter on the standing forage until October and after that the windrow contained more dry matter. Crude protein as I mentioned was a big one, consistently higher in the windrow and rapidly decreased in the standing crop. ADF content was consistently lower in windrow and the NDF ADF ratio was consistently higher in the windrow. The NDF or neutral detergent fibers showed no difference between the standing and windrow crops, no significant difference. However, potassium, zinc, iron, and, and copper were higher in the windrow crop. The overall summary in swath grazing is a viable option for many producers. It offers the potential to add value to a livestock enterprise through reduced feed and feeding costs, as well as manure handling costs. But I'm not really telling you to sell the baler. It means as with any new practice, swath windrow grazing takes planning. And if you're um, <coughs> baling hay, you're still going to need a baler for the early, maybe if you're doing more than one cutting on the first and second cutting of the season. Should also take into consideration the topography of the grazing area. You're going to need water sources, which may cost additional expenses or money. Uh, you may need shelter in some areas and, of course, fencing. And you have to look at the class of livestock uh, to be careful when you consider this practice. Implementing this grazing practice will require careful monitoring of livestock to ensure your livestock enterprise goals are being met. You got to know what the requirements of those livestock you're putting into those areas, what the forage is, is producing and providing for those livestock, and how to manage them to maintain the goals of your operation. And that's it for the swath windrow grazing. If you have any questions, you can contact Steve Foster or myself at 775-273 2923 or my email at fosters f at uncee.unr.edu. Thank you.